Good morning, sir. Good morning. Our first witness today is Sir Stephen Robson. Yeah. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you for the Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you give your full name, please? Stephen Arthur Robson. Uh, so, Stephen, thank you very much for attending today. Um, you should have in front of you a witness statement that's dated the 13th of September of this year. That's that right. right. Thank you. And on the final page of that witness statement, page 11, do you see a signature there? That's right. Is that your signature? It is. And is that statement true to the best of your knowledge? And yes, belief? it is. Thank you very Although much. Although, I should probably bring to the inquirer's attention the very first paragraph of my witness statement. Um, because it is important. Uh, as we all know, these are events of over 20 years ago, and my involvement was lasted about six months. So, uh, <clears throat> very much what I say in the witness statement, and indeed what I say today, should all be sort of have the implicit qualification that is as far as I recall. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Your witness statement um, for the record is WITN 03360100. That statement will go into evidence, so the questions I'll ask you today will be supplementary to that. Thank you very much. Um, starting with your background, you joined the civil service in 1969? That's correct. And apart from a secondment in the 1970s, you held a series of posts in the Treasury until 2001. Is that correct? Right? Uh, and you became second permanent secretary and were second permanent secretary at the relevant time. Yes. Um, your involvement in Horizon, I believe, began in January of 1999? That's, yes, that's right. And ended around May 1999? That's right. Um, you've described your role as looking at the Horizon project with a fresh set of eyes. Um, how is it that you became selected for that role? Well, <clears throat> the, w when the phrase, a fresh set of eyes, is actually one I think was put to me by the ministers at the time, rather than one that I subsequently uh, thought up. Um, the honest answer is I'm not quite sure how it came to be that I was selected for the role. There have been uh, two other people who had looked at, reviewed the Horizon project previously, um, <coughs> Corbett and Montague. And um, I think probably as the eyes went round, there was very hard to find who the third person was going to be. And um, so I drew the short straw. Did you have technical expertise? I had no technical expertise in uh, IT or software at all. And did you see your role as requiring those kinds of expertise? No, I, there, there were plenty of people around the project who had views on the software and on the uh, the, the IT equipment themselves, and indeed there had been a review chaired by Montague in the uh, middle of 1998, which had looked at the, the uh, <coughs> software, uh, well, the, the Horizon system. Um, so there were plenty of other people around who had knowledge of these matters. Your involvement included acting as a direct liaison uh, with the chief executive of ICL, Keith Todd, is that right? Well, he, he was the person that I, in, in discharging the remit that ministers gave to me, uh, he was the person that I dealt with uh, at ICL, along with Richard Christou, who I think was the finance director there at the time. And was Mr. Christou the negotiator for ICL, or was he seen as the negotiator? Probably slightly more. I mean, they, they were both uh, negotiated at different times. I think probably Mr. Christou was slightly more the negotiator. Um. We'll get to it shortly, but you also joined uh, a meeting with the Prime Minister and senior executives from Fujitsu, is that right? Oh, well, I, there was a meeting with the Prime Minister with uh, uh, Mr. Naruto, who was the Vice Chairman of, of uh, Fujitsu at one point, yes, and I joined that meeting. Who else were your main points of contact during this period, whether it be the Post Office, the Federation, the unions? The main points of contact were... Um, 
Mrs. Graham of the Department of Social Security, uh, Stuart Sweetman of the Post Office, and uh, David Civic of DTI. To what extent was it considered appropriate uh, during your involvement uh, for the government or civil servants to be negotiating directly with ICL uh, rather than the Post Office? Um, it, it was, it was a, the agreed position of the ministers of the various departments that I should be the point of contact for those discussions. And how did the post office feel about that? Uh, I never asked them how they felt about it, but they went along with it. Um, I'm going to start today talking about your background knowledge, the, the knowledge that you obtained when you first started in your role. Um, were you aware of any of the detail of the procurement process when you started? I, I was aware of procurement um, policies generally uh, in, in the public sector. Were you aware that Pathway, which uh, was ICL, became, uh, was the least preferred bidder uh, from a technical perspective in the original procurement exercise? No, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, w when you asked me the question about procurement, I was, asking, I was responding in general terms about procurement policy, not about the procurement of this particular project. Um, were you aware of any concerns that were raised at the procurement stage, uh, such as that the system could prove unreliable and had a fragile software system? No, I wasn't aware of that. Um, you were aware of the Montague report when you started. Yes. Um, and I think you've said in your witness statement, it's paragraph 11, that his report had concluded that the infrastructure was robust by industry standards. And in your view, the issue of technical feasibility couldn't be assessed as the three parties, that is uh, ICL, DSS or BA, and the post office took different views on a range of technical issues. Um, you've used the word infrastructure in relation to the Montague report. Um, did you understand the Montague report as uh, in somehow signing off the uh, abilities and reliability, for example, of the Horizon system, or, or did you see it as focused simply on, or, or particularly on, the overall um, feasibility of the system? Yeah, I think I, I took it to be the latter. Um, did uh, everybody you dealt with take it to be the latter, or were there differing opinions as to the importance of the Montague report? There was not a great deal of discussion of the Montague report, to be honest. Um, the discussion was focused much more on the situation in the project at the time, uh, which was, as, as I say in my evidence, you know, one of uh, criticism, uh, distrust, and uh, a lack of any real agreement on a way forward. And why did you feel at that stage the technical feasibility couldn't be assessed? Because the views of the different parties were not aligned. Um, and can you expand on that slightly? Well, it, it, it was the case that um, they, if you sat in a meeting with um, the, the various parties uh, and tried to have a discussion about the state of the project, it, you got uh, a, a, a lot of complaint, criticism, and lack of trust between the different parties as to what the state of the project was, to the extent that the state of the project wasn't satisfactory, why it wasn't satisfactory, and um, who thought it was it, that it wasn't satisfactory, and that um, you know this 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 just uh, was a, a like a cloud over the whole project at the time. So was it your view that because you didn't know what the end product would look like, uh, because it may have a benefits card, it may have a smart card, it may have something else, it wasn't appropriate at that time uh, to carry out technical feasibility tests? No, I mean, my feeling at that time, at that time we were focused very much, or the work was focused very much on the benefits payment card. And my view at the time was that given the state of the management uh, of the project, that it was very unlikely that you would ever deliver a benefits payment card. And were you aware 
when you joined or, or during your period of involvement of concerns at the ICL side uh, regarding what we know as the electronic point of sale system, the EPOS system? No, I wasn't. Were you aware of a report from Project Mentors in December of 1998, which was critical of the Horizon system? No, I wasn't. Um, to what extent were you aware of any um, concerns about technical issues with Horizon uh, when you started? Well, I was only aware to the extent that uh, when one sat down with the various parties, they were... Um, very ready to, to say in their view that the project was not working as it should be working and that um, most of the fault lay with one of the other parties. Did you form a view during your time as to uh, the technical aspects of Horizon? No, I didn't. I'm going to ask you about the smart card option, which mm -hmm. seems to be the principal issue that you were addressing. Can we start by looking at CBO 001401 underscore 039, please. Thank you very much. Um, this is a letter um, from 10 Downing Street from the private secretary on the 14th of January 1999. You started in, in January 1999. Yes. Uh, do you remember when abouts it was? was How about the, the, towards the end of the month. Um, would this have been a letter that you saw at the time? Well, it's, that's interesting you should ask that question because it, it appeared it, you, it was sent to me by the uh, inquiry yesterday or the day before yesterday, and I, it didn't ring a bell with me at all, um, and which I find quite surprising because when you come on, you get involved with something in the civil service, and Number Ten has expressed you know a rather clear view about the whole thing, one would expect to have seen it and to have absorbed it. Um, but I don't recall doing that. From your experience, is that kind of wording in bold there? Is that common for issues of this nature, or was that something you hadn't seen before? Well, I've, I've seen it before. It isn't common. If we could scroll down, please. This sets out the Prime Minister's um, position as at the 14th of January 1999. Mm. And it says the Prime Minister believes that our key objective should be to develop the Horizon project by negotiating with ICL the earliest possible move to smart cards. Mm. It would be extremely important to get the post office to take this negotiation seriously. But at the end of the day, if this negotiation does not succeed in improving upon the existing benefit payment card project, it would be better to accept this project than to pull out of the negotiation with ICL completely with all the damage it could do. Were you aware when you joined in January 1999 that the Prime Minister had this opinion? No, I wasn't. Were you aware that he supported the smart card option? No, I, I, I became aware that the policy unit at number 10 were well disposed towards the smart card option. Um, <clears throat> at paragraph 15 of your witness statement, you've said that as a result of your negotiations, the benefit card would be abandoned and the smart card would be introduced. Uh, that's obviously very consistent with uh, the Prime Minister's position set out here. Uh, where was your negotiating position coming from? Well, it was coming from the negotiating brief I was given by ministers, which is set out in paragraph 9 of my evidence. And, and which ministers was that? Well, it would have been uh, combined efforts of the uh, Secretary of State for Social Security, Secretary of State for uh, DTI, and the Chief Secretary of Treasury. Uh, to what extent during your involvement uh, did you consider you were taking forward the Prime Minister's decision as opposed to those ministers' decisions? Well, it, <coughs> at a later stage in the inquiry, in May time, the Prime Minister came up with uh, three very clear, uh, what were described by number 10 as political objectives for the negotiation. And <clears throat> in the latter stage of the negotiation, uh, they were very important. But, but they, uh, they, I mean, as I'm seeing this thing, as I, as I say, I don't recall having seen it before, but it, it, it is a sort of reflected in the negotiating brief that I was given, I set out in paragraph 9. Thank you. And moving now to February 
of 1999. Can we look at HMT 00000020, please? Thank you very much. Um, this is a note from Peter Schofield to yourself. Who, who was Peter Schofield? Peter Schofield was uh, one of the, well, the key people working with me on this uh, project. Uh, which department was... He was a treasury person. Thank you. Um, this note begins, you met with Keith Todd and Richard Christou on the 29th of January. So in your first month of your involvement, you had met with Keith Todd uh, and yep. Richard Christou. Uh, and Peter Schofield was also present. I'm going to read to you um, the final few paragraphs. Can we look at the second page, the bottom of the second page, and it's paragraph five. Um, I'm going to read it um, for the record. Paragraph five says, you asked whether the payment of benefits into these social bank accounts accessed by a smart card would be a way of moving to ACT um, without the transitional phase of a benefit payment card. This would take the BA out of the contract, leaving them to concentrate on getting their own IT systems ready for ACT. Uh, for people who wanted it, there could be some means of transferring money from social bank accounts to conventional bank accounts, but many people would still go to post offices to obtain their benefits, either because they, and over the page, please, thank you, uh, do not have another bank account or just because of inertia. Uh, this would help maintain footfall and give, customer, give a customer base from which to launch citizen-centric government and other applications for the smart card. Uh, Christou said they would look at this over the weekend uh, at the commercial and financing implications and whether it was technically possible without making significant changes to hardware. He hoped to have completed a broad brush stress test of the option by Monday the 1st of February. Uh, Todd emphasised the pressure he was under on timing. Um, now, th the reference there, Christou said he would look at it over the weekend. Um, do you think it was appropriate at this stage, um, so February 1999, for there to be yet another option on the table with regards to the Horizon project, in this case, the, the smart card option? Yes, I think there was, because, as I say... Um, <clears throat> It, was, I, I, it seemed clear to me, and I think to others, that the situation on the benefit card project was such that it was never going to be successfully delivered. So it made sense to start looking at alternatives. The mention there by Mr Christie that they would look at it over the weekend, it seems as though things are moving quite rapidly and considerations such as this are happening, happening at quite some speed. Do, do you agree with that? Yes. Um, and again, do you think it would was appropriate um, for quite fundamental changes to be uh, being discussed at this stage uh, in respect of the Horizon project at, at speed? Well, yes, it was, because um, as far as I was concerned, the project was going down a cul-de-sac, and therefore it made sense to start looking for some alternative, because every day that passed was, was consuming more time and more money. And to what extent do you think that these kinds of further options that were being discussed at this stage uh, impacted uh, or detracted from uh, looking at the technical issues that were arising at that stage? Well, I don't think they were, because the, the, in, in the pack of paper you sent me, there, there's evidence that the uh, people working on the project were still exchanging letters about it uh, as late as May. With regard to, for example, the, the, the government's approach to the project? No, this was re as regards you know, questions about whether, whether it should go into live testing or not. So a lot of work, it, all I'm trying to respond to your point is that work was continuing on the project despite the fact that these alternatives were being looked at. Um, absolutely, but in your statement you said that, for example, because there were so many different opinions at that stage, um, it wasn't really... Uh, appropriate to be looking into the technical side of things because we didn't know where it was going to end up. No, I don't think that's quite what I was saying. What I was saying was, uh, it, <coughs> it was it wasn't very it wasn't possible to for me to draw conclusions on the technical state of the project because whichever of the parties you talked to had different views about it and different opinions on whose fault it was that it wasn't working as it should have been, um, and. So 
the, the, uh, the, 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 as far as I was concerned, these differences of view and of behaviour were such that the benefit payment card was most unlikely ever to be delivered, or to be delivered at all, and it made sense, therefore, to consider what the alternatives were. This is kind of what bringing a fresh pair of eyes is all about, I think. And could I ask you, Sir Stephen, the impression you're giving me is that you formed the view that the benefit payments card would not come to fruition pretty early on in your involvement. Is that correct? That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one thing that you just mentioned is discussions about testing, for example. Uh, and I'd like to take you to a couple of letters that you've seen um, from David Miller at the post office. Um, can I just ask, uh, it's paragraph 31 of your witness statement. You say that in April of 1999, uh, Pockle were concerned that more testing would delay the project. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Well, <coughs> simply that this is, uh, the, the, this is what was, is, was, was said at the time in these letters. And you know, I took to be their view. And um, the, the uh, benefits agency uh, wanted to carry on doing more testing before it went into a live trial. And Pockle took a different view. Um, it, was, it, uh, it, was, it was part of the, it was a, a small example of the problems of the project. Were you aware of the benefits agency's concerns about the need for more testing? Yes, I was. <coughs> And what did you think about them at the time? Well, I, as I say in this witness statement, uh, my view was that um, in, in the context of moving to a, a new project of some sort, it was important that the contracts were set up in a way that allowed for proper uh, <coughs> acceptance tests to be set out. Um, let's look at those two documents can we start with poll 00028407, please? Um, this is a letter of the 1st of April uh, to Vince Gaskell. And perhaps we can just look at the final page. Um, so it says there in the conclusion from, uh, from this letter from Dave Miller, the Horizon Project Program Director, uh, one can always argue uh, that more comfort could be gained from a further model office test cycle. However, the results from the target testing, together with other points made above, lead us to the very clear conclusion that there are no outstanding faults that prevent entry to live trial. The stability of the solution in target testing gives confidence that there's no major risk of new faults arising. Uh, the BA and POCL can obtain further assurance by the planned additional testing activities. Required changes can be included in the pathway service in a controlled manner, uh, and the current testing status can't justify two more months of additional model testing. The post office and ICL and Fujitsu strongly endorse this conclusion, and this view will be represented at the highest levels. We could not agree to a continuation of testing that effectively would result in a six-month delay to roll out until after year 2000. I trust that the BA will also be able to support this conclusion. Is that an example uh, of the kind of thing that you've talked about in your witness statement about uh, the post office being concerned that more testing, um, in this case model office testing, would delay the project? Correct, yes. And can we look at one more example? And that's poll 00028406. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to look at the, the paragraph under general points. Um, again, this is a letter to Vince Gaskell um, from Dave Miller in his uh, position as Horizon Program Director. <clears throat> and it says there, I understand your concern about the impact of errors on the DSS and our joint need for a high quality system, but we are not asking the DSS to accept the system or to proceed with rollout at this time. We're moving to a live trial in 300 offices with four to five months of further operational experience before a decision on contractual acceptance. This gives the opportunity to evaluate the fitness for purpose of the solution in the field while in parallel carrying out 
continuing testing, for example, in the multi-benefit model office. Uh, what we have to judge at this time is the manageability of the risk of entry to live trial and to balance this with the cost and delay to all parties of a further postponement of rollout. Um, were, were these kinds of points quite typical um, during your period of involvement? Yes, they were. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and to what extent do you consider that uh, all of the various options that were still in play as at April 1999 influenced the decision of the post office uh, to just get on with Horizon, irrespective of where they were at on a technical level? Well, I think the post office still hoped uh, that the benefit payment card could be delivered successfully. Um, <coughs> I mean, I, I, in my mind, it was a, a vain hope, but I think they still did, and they, they worked accordingly, and they, I think they found it very hard to see how any alternative was going to serve them well in the future. And these kinds of discussions about uh, not carrying out further model office testing at that stage, for example, um, were you or anyone around you concerned that the impression given by the post office was that they wanted to rush things out? Well, they certainly wanted to press on. I mean, they were certainly concerned about um, slippage of the time uh, scale of the whole project. Uh, so, in, yes, it, in that sense, it was. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to a, a different topic now, and that's um, matters relating to the Prime Minister. Um, you were present during a meeting between the Prime Minister and Mr. Narutu in April 99, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and was that the only such meeting that you were present at? Yes. Yeah. Um, would you, when you came to this project, have a, expected such a level of prime ministerial involvement in the matter? Yes, I think I would. I mean, this was, clear, this, this was a major project uh, that was going wrong. And it, it had potentially widespread repercussions, uh, not just for the public sector, but for um, all the sub-postmasters involved in running the post office system. <clears throat> and what do you recall of that particular meeting in April 1999? Um, it, it, it was fundamentally a courtesy meeting on the Prime Minister's part. Mr. Naruto uh, came to press the case for getting a legally binding agreement quite quickly. Um, he said, I think, at the time before the Fujitsu board meeting in late April. Um, the Prime Minister gave him no such commitment, but did it very pleasantly. And to what extent did Fujitsu's um, financial position at that stage affect the Prime Minister's position, as far as you could tell? Well, I think, I think the, the Prime Minister was conscious of Fujitsu being a major inward, inward investor in the UK. And um, he also was aware that they, the, uh, the prospect of uh, the, this project not working would have adverse consequences for them. I'm not sure whether at that stage he'd quite uh, been informed about the, the possible impact on their accounts of having to make a provision for the pathway project. Uh, but he did become conscious of it at a later stage. Thank you. Can we look at uh, one document that you have seen very recently? And that's CBO 6046. Um, this yeah. is a letter from the Prime Minister uh, and to Mr. Sekizawa of Fujitsu. Uh, and it says there, I was most grateful to receive your kind letter on the 19th, of the 19th of March. Um, I have indeed maintained a close personal interest in developments at Acliffe uh, and have been enormously encouraged by your company's unreserved and wholehearted commitment to the work of the response group. Um, do you recall what happened at Acliff. Not really. I seem to remember there was a closure of a Fujitsu uh, establishment there. Thank you. And perhaps we could go to the next paragraph. 
just to summarise this letter, I think you've seen it very recently, so I'll, I'll just read a, a couple of lines. Um, it says there, the fate of your former employees uh, was a, of particular concern to me. And the next paragraph says, meanwhile, however, it was also important that every possible opportunity should be explored in order to find a buyer for the plant who could make use of the existing skill base. Perhaps we could go over the page, please. Thank you. Um, and the final paragraph there says, the Acliff closure was a major setback for all concerned, but I assure you that my colleagues and I place great value on Fujitsu's deep and long-standing commitment to the United Kingdom. Your contribution to the competitiveness of our telecommunications and IT industries has been outstanding, and I wish you every success for the future. Um, were there at the meeting that uh, you were at um, shortly after this letter was sent any discussions uh, about Fujitsu's plant <coughs> closing in the Prime Minister's constituency? And not that I recall. What do you recall about the Prime Minister's uh, discussions at that meeting? The one, the, the one with Mr. Naruto? Yes. Well, as I say, it was Mr. Naruto came along uh, and pressed for a decision on uh, the, the Horizon project and pressed for one to be made uh, in time for his board meeting in April. Uh, the Prime Minister listened to him um, uh, politely but yet gave no such commitment. If the Prime Minister had mentioned matters relating to his constituency, do you think you would have remembered that? Probably not, to be honest. Would it have surprised you? No. Uh, I mean, if, when, when the Prime Minister or indeed any minister meet someone who's had s some involvement with their constituency, uh, albeit not the main meeting, uh, meet, uh, point of the meeting, it does often does get mentioned. Thank you. Can we look at CBO 6022 underscore 002, please? Um, this is a letter from 10 Downing Street um, to the Chief Secretary's office. Um, it's from Jeremy Hayward, the, the Principal Private Secretary. Principal. And this is towards the end of your period of involvement. I'm just going to read to you um, three paragraphs from that letter. Perhaps we could just scroll down slightly. Um, it, so the, second, the first substantive paragraph there says, the Prime Minister has now discussed this with the Chancellor, who set out in more detail the Treasury's concerns about signing up today to option B1. I think option B1 was the smart card option. Is that right? That's right. Uh, the Chancellor said that this would be something of a leap in the dark. For example, it was not clear what discussions had taken place with the banks on the viability of this option, what demand there would be for the new smart card, or how willing benefit recipients who already had bank accounts would be to use the proposed POCL bank accounts. We needed more time to bottom out these issues. Uh, it would be wrong to commit the government now to an option that would cost £400 million uh, more over the CSR2 period than the best alternative. This would simply divert resources away from the government's key priorities to the next CSR. Against this background, the only sensible course of action would be to buy more time to consider all the options in more, much more depth. Uh, the most rational option would, be, would probably be termination. Can I just pause there? Uh, were you aware uh, at that stage that the Prime Minister's view was that the uh, most rational option would probably be termination. Uh, no, I wasn't. I actually think that those words might be the words of the Chancellor at the time. I mean, my reading of this letter was that that was, that was still the Chancellor's opening kind of commentary. Uh, and was that a view that was shared by others, for, to the best of your recollection? I don't think... Uh, <coughs> I mean, th so there, were certainly, there were certainly people involved in it who thought that termination might have been the best option you know, if we were starting with a kind of clean sheet, as it were. Um, but I don't think there were many people who thought that termination was very attractive because the, quite apart from the problems with 
uh, the post office and you know, what were you going to do to, um, to, to, to make the counters more efficient and, if, and, and win more business, uh, there were real risks with termination that uh, we could well, we the government, the public sector, could well have been uh, seen as uh, doing this uh, termination for convenience, in which case the, uh, the cost in terms of uh, settling with ICL would have been high. Thank you. Um, I'm going to continue. It says, but given where we are starting from uh, with ICL, it would probably be best to commit now to option B3 and agree to do further intensive work on option B1 over the next three months. He therefore proposed that Steve Robson should write to ICL this evening along the lines of the attached draft. And there's a draft letter attached to this letter. Uh, it continues, the Prime Minister said that he had not had time to look into the options in detail. Starting with a clean sheet, it was doubtful whether we would want to devote substantial new resources to a project that appeared to be designed largely to prop up the post office network. However, we were not starting from a clean sheet. He was content for the Chancellor uh, to go over his concerns in more detail with Lord Faulkner and other interested parties to try to find an agreed way forward. Any solution should meet three key political requirements. And I think these are the ones that you were referring to at the beginning of your evidence. That's right. Uh, and those are, number one, we did not want a huge political row with the post office or the sub-postmaster's lobby claiming that the entire rural network had been put in danger by the government. Two, we should not put ICL's whole future at risk. And three, it would be important to ensure the government had a fully defensible position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the PAC. Um, were you aware of, of what the first of those political requirements meant in respect <coughs> of not wanting a huge political row with but the post office or the sub-postmasters? I know what it meant in terms of the words on a piece of paper. What it, what it meant in practice um, was less easy to fathom. Can you expand upon that? Well, simply, you know, who? it was hard to know what, it, what might trigger. I mean, one could see that uh, in, if the, the uh, post office and sub-postmasters had felt they were being totally abandoned, then it could indeed trigger a huge row. But things that were less than total abandonment, um, how big a row they would uh, produce it, it was something of conjecture. Do you know where the message was coming from in respect of the sub-postmasters? So there's reference there to the post office and sub-postmasters. Um, where was the message coming from in respect of the concern being that the rural network might be put in danger? Well, I, <clears throat> I mean, I don't think a message was, current, was at that time being received, but messages of that sort had been received in the past and, and they tended to come uh, from the post office itself, from DTI as a sponsor department, and also from the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters. Can we look at HMT 6028, please? This is a note from yourself on the 20th of May 1999, so quite close to the end of your involvement to the Chief Secretary. Um, perhaps we could start at page two, please. This sets out some of the background. Pa paragraph three says, um, against this background, we've been seeking a deal with ICL based on option B3. This involves abandoning the benefit card. Um, Pockle would buy the basic ICL Horizon platform BA would move to ACT over the period 2003 to 2005. This option could provide a platform on which to build Pockle's network banking strategy and for modern government services. Um, so towards the end of your involvement, was this the position that was being reached or discussed? This was a position that had been reached, yes. And can we look over to page four, please? And at the bottom of that page, I'm just, again, going to read for the record a few paragraphs. It's going to be paragraphs 9 to 11. 
Paragraph 9 says, as regards the post office and sub-postmasters, I cannot claim the post office are happy with this deal. Their chairman's views were set out in his letter of the 18th of May attached, and I'll take you to that letter in a moment. They really want option A, the benefit payment card. If the proposed deal goes ahead, the chairman set out certain terms, including a delay in the start of ACT until 2005. Uh, this would have a seriously adverse impact, some 200 to 250 million pounds on the MPV of the deal. He also wants guarantees on income from and funding by the government and a firm commitment by the government to use the POCL system extensively for existing and new services. It is hard to see how these can be given. The government will presumably want to use the best value suppliers for its services and not tie itself to POCL regardless of costs. The sub-postmasters will no doubt be unhappy with the loss of the benefit payment card and the timing of the move to ACT. Uh, but we should be providing them with an IT system, we would be providing them with an IT system uh, which will automate their basic services and provide a platform for modern government and network banking. Um, I'm going to take you to the letter um, from the chairman, um, just so that it's in your mind. One thing I'm going to be asking you is where um, that information from sub-postmasters, that's paragraph 11, was coming from. Um, and perhaps we, we can look at the letter that is POL 00028612. Uh, I'll take this letter relatively quickly um, because I think you, you have seen it uh, and the detail doesn't really matter, save for that it doesn't really go into any detail about the views of the sub-postmasters. Perhaps if we scroll down and over to the next page and, and scroll down to the bottom of the next page. I mean, there is their concern in that penultimate paragraph. It says, in such circumstances, it would be impossible for us to sustain the current nationwide network. So there are concerns there being raised by the post office about the network. Um, but I don't believe there's anything in that letter that uh, raises concerns in particular from the sub-postmasters. Um, and and I th I'll take you to another document, and that um, relates to a meeting that you had with Stuart Sweetman on the 18th of May. Perhaps we can look at that. That's NFSP 00000157. Um, so this is a fax to Colin Baker from Stuart Sweetman. Uh, and it seems to be a fax. Uh, he's staying at a hotel in London. Um, I will read that letter out to assist. It says, Dear Colin, it's now 4.15 a.m. and I've just arrived home, um, having been at the Treasury with Steve Robson, Second Permanent Secretary, and then a meeting with Stephen Byers and Alan Milburn at the House of Commons. Uh, just pausing there, do you, do you remember that meeting at all? Uh, no, I don't. You don't remember the meeting? I don't remember the meeting. No. Well, I had quite a lot of meetings with uh, uh, Milburn and and um, and, by, and by us. But uh, and I don't, with Sweden. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure what the date of this. The, if we look is. at the top, it's the 18th of May of 1999. I certainly don't recall a meeting around that time, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, it says uh, things continue to move forward, but slowly. It is clear there will be further meetings during the day, uh, preparing for another meeting of ministers tomorrow afternoon. Um, so I suppose, well, it's 4.46 on the 18th of May, so perhaps the first meeting happened on the 17th of May, further meetings on the 18th of May. W was that a particularly busy period of discussions with the Yes, it was. Actually, yeah. um, I now need some sleep and to be in London tomorrow. Um, so it may be that the Royal Hotel isn't in London. Um, somebody might be able to tell me. Um, I now need some sleep and to be in London tomorrow. I fully, um, I, I feel really guilty not uh, up uh, something uh, to your com coming to your conference and bringing your executive and delegates up to date with progress. But I need to be in London. Please pass on my apologies uh, to the conference and over the page. Um, my message is there has not yet been a decision by ministers. Matters remain finely balanced. 
I can confirm that the ministers involved with the decision-making are very aware of the concern that exists in the minds of sub-postmasters up and down the country. Uh, the Post Office Board and my team in Pockle remain steadfast in our aims to secure a deal that is in the interest of all those in the business. Uh, my commitment is that within 24 hours of a decision on the way forward, I will meet with the NFSP Executive Committee to explain to you what has been decided and the implications for all concerned. Um, thank you very much. That can be taken down. So, so returning back to that note that you produced on the 20th of May to the Chief Secretary, uh, which says that the sub-postmasters will no doubt be unhappy um, with the loss of the benefit payment card, um, et cetera. Where would the information about the sub-postmasters' views have come from? What was Stuart Sweetman and, and the post office the uh, ordinary route to express sub-postmasters' views, or, or were you hearing directly from the National Federation, the CWU, or, or something else? No, I wasn't hearing directly from the National Federation. Uh, <clears throat> I, had, I had heard from, from Stuart Sweetman that they, you know, the, the sub-postmasters were going to be unhappy about the BPC being lost. Uh, the fact that it said in this uh, submission of mine uh, that um, they, they, I can't remember the precise words, that uh, by giving them the high, high horizon infrastructure, uh, that may uh, mean that they weren't quite so angry as purely speculation on my part. Um, we saw earlier those letters from David Miller and his views on further testing. Um, in this period, in these what were quite considerable crunch talks, um, what, if anything, was being said to you about concerns of the operation of the Horizon system? Nothing was being said to me at, those, <coughs> at this stage about that. I mean, apart from this sort of flow of letters that one saw now and again. Uh, nothing in... Oh, do you mean the letters from uh, regarding not testing, not... No, yes, these letters that we've just been talking about. Um, at the time of your involvement, from what you saw, what extent uh, of consideration of the sub-postmaster's position focused on um, ensuring the network had horizon, uh, had automation, rather than, for example, the reliability or effectiveness of such a system? Well, I think there, I think there were both were. Uh, considerations. I mean, there's clearly no point in giving people IT systems that don't work, or not in ex ante, anyhow. Um, but uh, the, the situation in, in these, latter, these latter months was that the, the benefit... I, I don't think anybody was really arguing that the benefit card payment project was going to succeed. I mean, the post office were hoping that it was going to succeed, but I never had a a robust case put to me by them that it was going to succeed. Um, and when um, you know, the view was expressed that it was dysfunctional and, and not going to succeed, nobody yes. really pushed back hard on that statement. But to what extent were the discussions of the sub-postmaster's position really focused on the fact that sub-postmasters would want automation rather than any wider concerns uh, about the actual technical abilities or reliability of such a system. It was yes. The the, the view was very much as, as you say that the sub postmasters would, would want uh, automation of, of, of the counters. Um, I mean, you know, nobody actually suggested that it was all right if it was automation, but it was flawed automation. Uh, but yes. They, the, the view was very much that they wanted automation, and by implication, automation that worked. Um, it may be a given that they would want a system that worked, but to what extent during your period of involvement was anybody raising with you uh, concerns of sub-postmasters regarding the Horizon system at that stage? Nobody was raising any concerns of the sub-postmasters at that stage. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Um, I'm not sure that anybody else... Yes, um, Mr Jacobs has some questions. Thank you. Um, Chair, could I just ask so if you can see and hear me? 
I can hear you, and no doubt in a moment I'll see you. Thank you. It normally takes a second or two. Yes, I can see you clearly now, Mr. Jacob. Good morning. I um, ask questions on behalf of 156 sub-postmasters um, who were um, the victims of this scandal um, and who, um, in, in the main part, gave evidence in uh, February to uh, May of this year. Um, I want to ask you about the meeting that you attended with Mr. Naruto um, in April 1999. Um, You've said um, that um, Mr. Naruto um, was pressing for a decision, but um, do you recall whether he said anything else at that meeting? No, uh, <coughs> I don't. Re I, uh, I regret to say I, I don't recall him saying. He may well have said other things, but I mean the the main message he he gave at that meeting was very much he and his board needed a decision uh, as by I think it was twenty third of April. It was a very precise date, anyhow. You said, um, in answer to questions from Mr. Blake, um, that the Prime Minister was aware of adverse consequences surrounding um, Fujitsu and the project. Well, uh, he was aware um, by, the, by the latter stages of, of this debate in, in May that Fujitsu were very concerned about the prospect of having to make a, uh, a large provision in their accounts for the, uh, the pathway project and was aware that uh, this was a matter of considerable concern to Fujitsu. And he was also aware that um, Fujitsu, uh, if they weren't going to make this provision, really needed a, a decision from the government in the latter part of May. Could I um, uh, turn up a document, um, and this is BEIS uh, 0000336. It's a note. Um, from the British Embassy in relation to a meeting <coughs> held with Mr. Naruto um, in December 1998. And if we could go, please, to paragraph 9. I'm afraid that's scrolling further down. Um, yes, just a slightly further up. So um, there were three concerns that the British Embassy communicated as a result of their meeting with Mr. Naruto a few months before. Um, and one can see at paragraph 9, firstly, that Fujitsu would publicise their, 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 publicise their criticisms of the project manage, management. Secondly, the damage to the relationship between Her Majesty's government and Japanese companies invested in Britain. And thirdly, that the waves created would be politically damaging at home um, and to the UK's position of strength vis-à-vis -vis our European competitors. Um, well, the question I have um, for you is, did this reflect the view of the government at the time when you attended the um, meeting in um, April 1999 with Mr. Naruto? No, I don't think it did. I mean, as I say, the, the meeting was... He, he was the one who made most of the running at the meeting. The, as I recall it, the Prime Minister listened to him you know, politely uh, and, and conspicuously avoided giving any commitments to him. Um, this, I, I don't recall this, this, the material in paragraph 9 here uh, being influencing the meeting. You were taken by Mr Blake to a, um, a document that was authored by you. And if we could go back to that briefly, it's HMT 00000028. Thank you. And if we go to page two of five, um, so these are um, the Prime Minister's three key political requirements that you set out. And you can see we didn't want a huge political row with the post office or sub postmasters lobby claiming the entire rural network had been put in danger by the government. And two, um, we shouldn't put ICL's whole future at risk. And three, it would be important to assure that the government had a fully defensible position vis-a-vis -vis the PAC. I want to um, look at number two. Um, this um, political um, objective not to put ICL's whole future at risk, was that linked to the damage to international trade with Japan that that could cause? Yeah, I think it, it was re reflecting of his concerns that, that Britain should remain an attractive area for inward investment. Um, 
What I would say, what I, now you've brought up these three objectives, um, it, as it turned out, objectives two and three did actually kind of end up with the same outcome, namely buying the hardware of the system, which also turned out to be the cheapest solution for the government. Thank you. Um, and finally, the question that um, I, I'm asked to put on behalf of my clients is, um, looking back, um, do you accept that the financial and political motivations that we see here overrode the need to produce a system that was suited to the needs of the sub-postmasters who were to operate Horizon on, on the ground, so to speak? No, no I don't, actually. Um, I mean, oddly enough, the easiest thing would have been le to let the Horizon project continue and watch it slowly uh, come to the, the end of the cul-de-sac it was already in, uh, leaving you know, sub-postmasters and the post office with nothing at all. Um, that would have you know, kind of accorded with what the post office really wanted to do. It would have meant a considerable time of wait wasted effort and money. And it, one of the hardest things for a government ever to do is to accept that a path it has set upon has, has been the wrong path, that it has gone wrong. And you know, whatever else one might say about this episode was that in the end, ministers did accept that and faced up to it. OK, I'm just going to see if there are any more questions I have to ask of you. Nothing else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. OK. Um, Ms Page has some questions as well, sir. Flora Page appearing for a group of the sub-postmasters also. Sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. I'm also appearing for a group of sub-postmasters. Oh, right. Thank you. We've looked at one section of this document, but I'd like to look again, please, at HMT 00000020. Uh, this is a note from Mr Schofield about a meeting that uh, you attended with the um, representatives of ICL, Mr Christou and Mr Todd. Um, so it took place in, uh, on the 29th of January, and um, if we just go down to paragraph four on page two. <coughs> and we can just look really pretty much at that first sentence. Um, Todd made the following points. He felt that the move to compulsory ACT was not as simple as the BA suggested. And he then goes on to set out a number of the issues which he felt at that time were problematic about moving to ACT rather than having the benefit card continue. Is that right? Yes, I guess so, yes. So in other words, he at that stage was sort of more or less aligned with the post office position and wanting the benefit payment card to continue. Is, is that a fair representation? I'm not sure it was. I, I think that the, the uh, that ICL at that stage were already uh, quite interested in the smart card solution. Well, certainly when we get to Mr Christou's interjection a bit later down, that's the one which you've already seen where he mm. says, we'll look at it over the weekend. But um, this section from Mr Todd appears to be expressing reservations about it, does it not? Well, it... Um the, the third inset there, likewise, uh, natural points of access, which could be smarted by, supported by a smart card and a horizon infrastructure, um, but there probably would need to be a period of exclusivity, suggests to me that he, his, his mind wasn't uh, closed. Wasn't firmly on the set against. No, hmm? not firmly set against. No, not at all. no, but expressing a number of reservations is. Well, what uh, yes, I mean, uh, let's, I mean, all these things, you know, one has to sort of look at the context as well as the, the words. Mm. And, you know, Christou, uh, sorry, uh, Todd in this case, you know, in a sense, you know, not in a sense, in reality, he was negotiating uh, from the word, from the off. And therefore, you know, one had to sort of factor this into anything that he was saying. And, you know, you know quite how far was it uh, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, or how far was it coloured by negotiation? Yes, I see. So to some extent, this... Um will have been, perhaps from your perspective as a negotiator, 
a window of opportunity in the sense that he wasn't closed to That's the right. idea completely. Yeah. Well, that may then account for the document that I was going to uh, take you to next, if I may, which is DWP 00000202. And you may or may not be able to assist with this. Um, it's the final page of this, which is um, seemingly tacked on to a document which was sent to you. Um, but it also refers... It's dated the 2nd of February, and a little further down, it refers to the same meeting that took place, it says, last Friday. And I've, I've sort of looked at the dates, and it's clearly the same meeting between you. Apparently, Steve Robson had a meeting with Richard Christou and Keith Todd last Friday. And the author of this document says there was a firm proposal from ICL that the benefit payment card should be abandoned and that the DSS should move to ACT. Was this perhaps a slightly wishful gloss on... No, I, I, as, well, as I said to you when you first raised the previous document, that I thought that, the, that ICL were um, more open-minded than that, the paragraph that you drew my attention to immediately suggested. So I mean, <coughs> this, 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 again, may be a slightly, uh, uh, a slightly uh, <coughs> optimistic view of the meeting, but it's not entirely wrong. Yes, I see. Perhaps you can help me with this. I don't know if you can. At the top, it's not clear who wrote this. At the top, it, it bears a reference LCB. Does that mean anything to you? Sorry, I can't see the top now. If, if we just scroll up, the, the, the reference seems to be an L, uh, somebody called LCB. No, um, <coughs> it, it, it kind of looks like... I mean, I don't know who LCB is. I was just looking at who was at the meeting. It suggests to me it was maybe a benefits agency document, but that's uh, pure speculation. Yes, all right, thank you. There's only one other uh, document and question that I'd, I'd like to take you to, and that's um, HMT 0000013. And this goes forward to May and relates to a meeting ag again um, with. ICL, and at the second paragraph, um, this is Peter Schofield, the uh, author of this. He says, by the second meeting, ICL, Todd in particular, were clearly quite worked up. Uh, we therefore allowed them to do most of the talking, and this is in the context of the reservation on accounts. So evidently things were becoming difficult mm. for ICL at this stage. Um, were you under the impression that Mr Todd in particular that his personal position was on the line? Um, uh, the, I had heard some suggestion of that. Thank you. Those are my questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir, do you have any questions at all? No, I don't. Thank you very much. Um, at, at the commencement of your evidence, Sir Stephen, uh, Mr Blake uh, expressed his gratitude for you attending. Can I repeat my gratitude for you attending and also reading a good many documents, no doubt, before making your witness statement? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, could I ask that we take a 10-minute break now and then we will have uh, Lord Darling on screen? Certainly, yeah. So what time will that be, just so that I'm prompt? 10 past 11. Fine. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Good morning, sir. Can I uh, call Lord Alistair Darling, please? Yes. Um, obviously, there is a difference between the clock in the hall and my computer clock, which meant I joined a little early. So if anybody was listening, Lord Darling and I were exchanging pleasantries, but nothing more. All right? Thank you, sir. I understand that you're going to affirm today, so can I first of all check you can hear me? I can hear you, thank you. Okay. If you'd like to repeat after me, I do solemnly... I do solemnly... Sincerely and truly... Sincerely and truly... Declare and affirm... Declare and affirm... That the evidence I shall give... That the evidence I shall give... Shall be the truth... Shall be the truth... The whole truth... The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Darling. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the um, inquiry. Can you give us your um, full name, please? It's Alastair McLean, darling. Uh, can I start by expressing the inquiry's thanks for you um, providing a witness statement of 41 pages to us and for uh, giving evidence via video link today? Uh, can we um, uh, look at your witness statement, please? It's WITN 0400. And on yes, page, Roger. thank you. And on page 41, there should be a signature. Is that your signature? That's my signature, and that's the date on which I signed it. Thank you. Can we just go back to page 33 of the witness statement, please? Sorry, one moment. Yes, I've got it. Thank you. And uh, in paragraph 97, there is a date. Um, it says by April 1998. Should that read uh, April 1999? Yes, it should, yes. Uh, thank you very much. With that correction, are the uh, contents of the witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are true to the best of my knowledge and belief. As I say in the uh, opening paragraphs of my statement, um, I have read all the papers the inquiry has sent to me, uh, and I'm satisfied on the basis of my own knowledge of what happened and what I've seen, that this is a true account of what happened. But I do make the point that I know that I've not seen all the papers I saw at the time. Yes, and in particular, I think you're um, concerned about papers that um, would have been marked up or marginally annotated by you. Is that right? Yes. What, what these papers don't record are meetings that I might have had. Uh, what is very important, too, is in terms of my knowledge, uh, you, really, you don't get letters just put in front of you. You'll have a covering note from your private office saying you should be aware of this, this is what it's about, uh, what do you want to do. But I think I cannot think of an instance where I saw papers during the time I'm minister and I didn't put some remark on them, even a tick. I know that because I saw papers from my time at the Treasury about 10 years ago, and absolutely everything was the original documents that I've seen. Now, I don't know if they still exist for the DSS or the DWP, but I just make that point. Having said that, I think what, I, what, I've, got, what I've got in my statement uh, is an attempt uh, to answer all the questions the inquiry put to me, and it's done on the best of my knowledge and belief. A lot of it, though, comes from my own recollection, but is fortified by some of the stuff that I've seen. But it's just that caveat. There may be stuff around that's, that, um, that I haven't seen you know, in the last 25 years, um, but uh, if that's the case, no doubt you'll draw that to my attention. Uh, thank you. Can I start with your background and experience? Um, I think you were part of the Labour government that came to power after the general election on the 1st of May 1997, having been an opposition MP for about 10 years before that. Yes, I was elected in 1987, so 10 years in opposition. I then uh, was appointed as Chief Secretary and I remain, remain, remained a member of the Cabinet for 13 years until May 2010. And important to the inquiry, I was Secretary of State first for Social Security, then as we re-engineered it, the Department of Work and Pensions for four years between 1998 and uh, 1990, uh, 2002. Thank you. So just um, after appointment um, or coming to power, you were appointed uh, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, a period that you held for about a year and three months until the 27th of July 1998. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And so you were Stephen Byer's um, predecessor? Yes, that's, he was the Chief Secretary for a fairly short period after me before he became Secretary of State for Trade and Industry. Um, and on that day, i.e. Um, 27th of July 1998, you became Secretary of State for Social Security, a position that you held for just under three years until the 8th of June 2001. Is that right? That's right. Uh, they're the two posts with which um, the inquiry is most concerned. But after that, you held a series of posts within government until May 2010, when a new administration came to power. That's right. And amongst those um, positions, there is one that I'm going to ask you about right at the end of our evidence session today, Secretary of State for Trade and Industry, between the 5th of May 2006 and the 28th of June 2007, so about 14 months. Yes, that's correct. Uh, can I um, start, please, uh, um, uh, with some questions concerning your first awareness 
of Horizon, um, the Horizon project in government. The first communication that the inquiry has been able to track down is a letter written uh, to you by John Denham, dated the 12th of August, 1997. Uh, can we look at that, please? It should come up on your screen. Um, DWP at <coughs> 6095. I'm not seeing anything yet. Should I be? No, we're not either. Um, I'm getting an, uh, a shake of the head from the document um, displayer. DWP 6095. Just bear with us, please. Thank you. Is that displayed on your screen, Lord Darling? Not yet. Oh, it is now, yes. Thank you well, very much. Well, it's back again. Right. I can see it now, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, you'll see that it's um, a, um, a letter dated the 12th of August, 1997. You can see that amongst the uh, extended copy list on the right-hand side. Yep. Um, it's from um, John Denham. Uh, then a minister in the DSS, uh, more formally the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Social Security. Can you see that from the top? I can, yes. And then if we just go um, to the third page, we can see it's signed off, PP'd for Mr Denham. And scroll down, please. Yes, I can see that. Thanks. And if we go back to the first page, please. Um, it's addressed to you in your position as um, Chief Secretary. And paragraph one, if we read um, together, our predecessors announced in May last year that the post office network and the payment of social security benefits across post office counters should be automated through a major PFI contract. The contract rather unusually has three parties, my department and Pockle as purchasers and ICL Pathway, originally a specially formed consortium but now a subsidiary company of ICL as supplier. Um, did you know anything about this contract before you um, uh, took up your post as um, Secretary of State, as Chief Secretary? I can't be sure of that because I haven't seen any papers from the Treasury. Um, however, you know, as I sort of alluded to at the start of my evidence, I would not just have had this letter put in front of me that would have been a covering note from my private secretary, you know, saying, what's this about? you ought to be concerned about it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it could be that um, I had been previously advised about it, as advised about an awful lot of things as Chief Secretary, uh, because of the nature of the job, but this is the first written evidence I've seen, but I am relying, as I said to you before, on what um, the inquiry has been able to retrieve from the archives. Yes, and in turn what um, your former department has disclosed to the... Yes, um, yes. ...to the inquiry. The yes, sir. The second paragraph um, <coughs> provides that the ambitions of the project are very large. And then if we go to paragraph three, please, a project to automate a wide range of functions in 19,000 post offices, as well as social security payments to over 20 million people is inevitably complex. And that complexity brings with it serious risks. The purpose of the letter is to alert to alert you to the fact that the project is already seriously behind its original timetable with equally serious consequences for the business case between um, our uh, predecessors. And then if we can um, look at paragraph five at the foot of the page, please, beginning however, and then look at the sentence three from the bottom. The National Federation of Sub-Postmasters mounted vociferous campaigns against um, ACT, automatic credit transfer, when the previous government gave any encouragement to ACT and has sought to maintain the role of um, post offices in paying benefits. The decision by the previous government to go <coughs> ahead with the current automation project appears to have been strongly influenced uh, by um, this context. And then yes, um, 
my view, that's Mr Denham's view, is that if the commitment to this project had not already been made, we should at the very least question whether it's sensible to sustain an expensive and outmoded pattern of payment delivery as a means of delivering a hidden subsidy to the post office. The question of whether we think it's right to subsidise post offices is quite distinct from questions about the most efficient and secure way of paying benefits. The problem with the previous government's approach is they've become inextricably confused. To your recollection, what view did you form about this at that time in your, with your uh, Chief Secretary to the Treasury hat on? Well, the, there's two elements. I suppose the first one, that what John, um, John Denham was saying, is the Treasury ought to be aware of this. The project has slipped and therefore there will be financial consequences. And, you know, that's a direct Treasury concern for obvious reasons. But looking at the, the bigger picture, if you like, um, I had a great deal of sympathy with, with what John Denham was saying. He was a minister that I great, you know, valued his judgment on, on things generally. Uh, but, it, you know, I, I fully understand that for the post office point of view, having guaranteed footfall is very, very important to them. And at that time, the majority of people uh, in receipt of benefits would have to go to the post office to cash their gyro uh, to uh, get um, their money. Uh, now, I can see that the last government, that's the government that was in power until 1997, was uh, trying to find what you might call an elegant solution, whereby the uh, benefits agency had a more secure way of making payments through a card, but it would also mean because the card had to be used in a post office, it would guarantee footfall. Now, my view of it, and the, when I looked at uh, John's letter and in the subsequent correspondence, was there were a number of problems with this, but... The in-principle objection I had was, that firstly, I did not think it was right that we should require people to go to a post office if they didn't want to. Uh, most people in their salaries got paid through ACT. ACT had been up and running for years. The banks ran it and it worked. Uh, and there was no reason why the then DSS should not also use uh, the uh, ACT system. In fact, I think I'm right in saying even at that time, nearly a third of benefit payments were being made through ACT. It would save the department about £400 million pounds a year. So I, I could not see the sense of using a card, which in, in any event, you know, it was subsequently clear to me, would have a limited um, a life because it would be redundant. You know, I think there's a second point, you know, which... Just, uh, just, is before, you, just before you go on, look, uh, that, that document come down from the screen. Um... This is just so that the chair can see you when you're giving your evidence for, darling. So, um, oh, sorry. No, no, of course. Um, you were about to move to a second point, I think. Yeah, my, my, my second point was this, that, um, you know, part of the approach that we had towards um, welfare reform uh, was we wanted to make it easy for people who'd got out of, come out of employment for or even to get back in. And in particular, you know, you know, the, the inquiry may recall that there was, at that time, there was a lot of stigma attached to people who were on benefits, political stigma, if, if, if you like. And I, I wanted to avoid a situation where if people came out of work, they would have to get their money paid through a card and have to go to the post office to get it if they didn't want to do so. They could, you know, using the post office is fine, but they shouldn't be forced to do it. And I didn't want to create, you know, a, a group of people who were, who were somehow different. Um, so I, to, I, the more people were included in the financial system uh, through ACT, as far as I was concerned, uh, the better for a whole variety of reasons. And then, you know, of course, the third problem was this, that, you know, the more people you've got in a contract, the more likely it is that it's going to start to go wrong. And from what I uh, saw, especially when I became Secretary of State, when the Montague uh, uh, Adrian Montague's um, commission uh, uh, produced his report, it was evident that you had a problem here. You had parties that did not have a common interest. And it seemed to me the project was doomed. So on principle, I was against what was being proposed. And in practical terms, I was also concerned that uh, the thing was never going to work. Uh, and, you know, that's really, that's in the front, was in the front of my mind from the time that I arrived at the DSS until the problem was resolved as far as the benefit payment card is concerned in the summer of 1999. Thank you very much um, for that, Lord Darling. We'll see expression of those two or three points, um, I think, across your evidence. Uh, They're in the statement, yes. Th th this morning. 
Can we um, uh, turn to your reply, please, um, to Mr. Denham's letter, um, CBO 6018? And if we just look at the second page, please, we'll see that it's um, signed off. If we go down, please. Thank you. By you. Yes. And then go back to the first page. It's dated the 29th of August, 1997. And yes. thanks, Mr. Denham, for his letter of the, um, the 12th of August. Um, you thank him for giving you early warning of the further difficulties this major project is experiencing and say in your paragraph two that you need to establish urgently whether the current project can be brought back on track. I hope it can, both in your department and the post office's um, interests. Given what you've just said about the in-principle objection um, to the inclusion of the um, benefit uh, payment card in the um, uh, programme, and therefore the inclusion of the benefits agency or the DSS within it. Why were you expressing a hope that the project can be brought back on track in um, uh, his department and the post office's interests? Well, this, this is this is at the the early stage. You know, as you say, it was I don't know it was the first, but it was certainly the first sight I'd had it had of it. And obviously, from the treasury's point of view, if you're terminating a contract, it is possible that you're going to incur uh, costs. Uh, and if the thing was could be made to work, um, then you know that's something the treasury would support. Um, however, um, you know as I said to you, uh, you know I, it, I think if you go further down the letter, I think if I'm from recollection, you know I do say uh, that um, you know this, whether or not we're doing the right thing is um, is questionable. And I think we're about uh, we're about to turn to that in in particular the suggestion yes, I mean, that there's it, some contingency planning. Um, that's should, that's right, should be undertaken. Of poor. So if we and go, also, it, it, I don't, sorry, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but I do, if you rather, I mean, I do recall that Margaret Beckett wrote in similar terms, and she got a more expansive reply from me, you know, really questioning whether or not this was a, the right thing to do. But I mean, you, you know, when you know, this was, you know, we were what two months into government at that stage. Um, uh, we were committed to pretty tight spending totals, and the chief secretary and, and me would naturally say, "Well, you know, is it fixable?" But the more I looked at this, the more, as I said to you, I came to the conclusion it was wrong in principle as well as wrong in practice. And just looking at the matter generally, was that your position when you were chief secretary, or did that uh, only become your position? when you moved over to be um, uh, Secretary of State for the DSS? I think, I think you know, from recollection of the, the material that I've seen, you will see in the correspondence, you know, I'm, I, I am gradually coming to this view. Obviously, when I got to the Department of uh, Social Security, where I was wholly responsible for the policy from then on, I again came very quickly to the view that, you know, it, it, was, on the wrong, it was on the wrong tack. Uh, and um, you know, it it also it was also clear by that time that the technical problems with it were becoming more and more apparent. It was running, about eighteen months late, even at that stage, and had been signed in nineteen ninety six. Uh, but you know, you, you know, when I, when I saw John Denham's letter where he raised all these difficulties, yes, in some cases, in some ways, it was a holding reply. Uh, but uh, you know, I. I think the more I looked at it, the more I came to the view that we were actually it was the wrong thing to do. And um, sticking with this early uh, phase at the moment, is paragraph four a reflection of that emerging view that you held, uh, reflected because you are suggesting some contingency work looking for the case for ACT in the event that the contract is pulled? Yes, and my guess also is that um, I would have had it's if not written and certainly you know verbal advice from the treasury to say um look um, because it's the advantage to, to both the department and the treasury is act is much much cheaper to run than what we were dealing with here but what i'm saying here is it's you know that clearly your you that is john denham was flagging up difficulties uh, we should be looking at an alternative um, way of making payment act in this case would you have understood that um uh, the withdrawal of the benefits agency uh, on the grounds that um, 
the objective can be achieved from its perspective through the use of ACT would have the effect of undermining a central tenant of the project, namely to drive people into the post office. Yeah, good. Yes, I mean, you know, the, you know, and Margaret Beckett, if you remember, uh, wrote to me, you know, make, making that point. But you still have to stand back from these things and ask yourself, is the right thing? Is this the right thing to do? And of course, and this is, wasn't a static situation. John Denham was writing, alerting me to the problems and the slippage, which I comment on. Um, you know, he also mentioned, you know, we should be looking at whether or not this is the right thing to do in the first place. And when you've got that, where clearly the contract's running into difficulties, it would make sense to look at the alternatives. And throughout the correspondence, you know, at, the, the, at this time, you know, I, I went, you know, mostly when I was legislate for um, Social Security, you know, I, I did make the point that we need to look at way, ways in which you can uh, subsidise, if you like, the post office network. As I said in my statement right from the start, as a government, we had two policies. One was to reform the welfare system the second was to maintain a network of post offices you know which proved to be difficult and i think is still difficult to this day you copied the letter to amongst others uh, margaret beckett who was then uh, the secretary of state for trade and industry and therefore held overall responsibility for the post office so um they in the dti would have been under no illusions that this was going on i.e the suggestion from the treasury to look at act as a contingency plan Yes, and I mean, I, obviously we don't know what advice was given to ministers in a previous government because we're, we're not told that. But um, uh, I think my recollection is that the DVLA had also uh, raised um, with, um, you know, in general, uh, you know, the position of using the post office as well. So it, it would not be new. It was known within government. Uh, and it really, what, what ministers had was clearly, a, uh, you know, a project that was stalling uh, and as you know, certainly as, as time went on, it was very clear that it had it stalled. And indeed, uh, our view was that um, uh, that uh, the suppliers were in breach of contract. Um, so you know, it, it, you know, it was an evolving view. But the more I looked at it, and certainly by the time I got the DSS, I was very clear that this was just the wrong way to proceed. And that uh, you know, even if you've been able to salvage it, it would have it would have been wrong in principle to be doing this. Thank you. That letter can come down. Can we look at Mr. Denham's reply to complete this series of correspondence? Um, CBO 6013. Thank you. Uh, you'll see this is a letter to you of the 14th of September uh, 1997. Yes. Uh, replying to the one that we've just seen. And can we look... <coughs> at the first paragraph, first substantive paragraph, PA Consulting, um, who were undertaking a review, are committed to delivering their review document on the 19th of September, so within the following week, uh, content to make it available. And then paragraph three, however, I would not want you to harbour any hopes that the project can be brought back on track fully. I understand the emerging view of the consultants undertaking the review is that the completion of rollout is likely to be at least 18 months beyond the original contractual date. This is at least an additional six month slippage beyond that reflected in the figures attached to my letter of the 12th of August. And this assumes the achievability and success of substantial organization and contractual changes, which the consultants are likely to propose. But further, I understand the consultant's initial view is that the original business cases of all three parties are highly vulnerable um, to uh, uh, slippage. Uh, that can be taken down, thank you. But what um, effect did that new news have, uh, to your recollection? Well, it, it fortified my belief that this was a project that was running into considerable difficulties. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, as I said to you, you know, the more I looked at it, the more I thought this is just going in the wrong direction. Um, but, you know, you have to... We had a contract, that is, the government had a contract, which brings with it certain obligations. Naturally, if it could have been sorted out to everybody's satisfaction, um, that would have been that would have been fine, except it didn't. It, it was getting worse progressively. But, you know, I, as I make clear in my statement, my 
overall view of this from in this entire period till the government decided, you know, as the the agreement with ICL came to an end, uh, that you know that having the a benefit payment card was just inappropriate, uh, and that if the if the post office network was going to survive, uh, then another way would have to be found to do that. We'll come on to this in more detail a little later, but just picking up what you said there. That reason that you've just given is one of principle that doesn't depend on the quality of the system that ICL is delivering. Is that right? Well, you know, the, the, the quality is inextricably looked, linked to this. And when you see something going wrong, you do stand back and say, well, are we going in the right direction in the first place? Um, you know, you know to, to have spent time trying to fix something, you know, which was clearly going wrong, and which they, obviously they no guarantee wouldn't go wrong again, um, you know, regardless of whether or not you're going the right direction, would seem to me to be odd. As it happened, these things were happening in parallel, if you like. The technical problems, you know, the difficulty in delivery, were becoming more and more apparent and got more and more, you know, obvious. You know, and, and it, you know, it, it, I, I think I would have been... Uh, It'd be very odd if I hadn't asked myself, well, should we be doing this in the first place? And I was pretty clear we shouldn't have been doing it. Can we push forward a little later into 1997 and look at DWP 6072? I think this is um, maybe the letter you were referring to earlier when you said that you were getting ahead of yep. yourself from um, Margaret Beckett. Yeah, it looks like it, yes. Um, who was uh, the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry um, to you, dated the 17th of October 1997. Um, yes, that's correct. It, it, we can skip over the first part of the first paragraph. And uh, pick up four lines in. I have seen copies of the recent letters between John Denham and you about slippage in the PFI project for automating post offices and benefit payments. I think that's the, uh, a reference yes. to the correspondence we've just looked at. I've yes. been reflecting carefully on the issues raised and the potential implications for Pockel. For a variety of reasons, the future viability of this most politically sensitive of the post office businesses looks increasingly fragile. Yes, I see that. So um, do you understand the part of the business that she's referring to? It was it, the post it, offices, yes. Is um, the Pockle part, Post Office Counters Limited, part yes. of the post office business? Yes, yes, that's right. And um, is she referring there to the entirety of the business, uh, i.e. Post Office Counters Limited business? Yes, and, you know, as I said to you, you know, um, I was fully aware um, of the general problem uh, that you know, for a number of years, the post the post office network uh, was you know in, in an increasingly difficult position, in that people, for a variety of reasons, were not going there because they could do whatever they needed to do elsewhere. You know, sale of stamps is a case in point, where you know you could buy them through shops and so on. But I mean, it it, it comes back to the wider point, which I think John Denham raised, uh, but you know, a fairly good point is. If the, government, if the government decides that there should be a network of post offices, it's a perfectly legitimate position to take, um, then, you know, and, you, it, and it needs to be subsidised, which, you know, certainly for most post offices, certainly outside urban areas, that's certainly the case, then there would have to be some sort of subsidy. That's a decision the government should have to take. From, you know, my point of view, um, firstly, as Chief Secretary, I was in, concerned about expenditure and certain expenditure on the contract that was going wrong. But then subsequently, as Secretary of State for um, uh, Social Security and Work and Pensions, uh, that it, it, it didn't seem to me to be right that, that that department was being asked to take on something which it did not need and did not want when there was another means of paying people's uh, benefit direct into their bank account. Thank you. Can we look at your reply, please, uh, which is CBO 00103065. Underscore eighty seven. Thank you. 
this is your reply. You thank um, Mrs. Beckett for her letter <coughs> of the 17th of October and say that you're aware that any fundamental changes to the business relationships between Pockle, BA and DVLA, which resulted in business moving out of post offices, would impact in a major way on Pockle. Uh, yes, you're, yes. Yeah. You're aware of the widespread perceived importance of the post office network and the sensitivities attached to it. And then over the page, please. And scroll down. Thank you. You say that's not to say, however, we should avoid asking questions about the optimum size of the post office network and the most sensible way of sustaining it. I agree that the post office review offers us the opportunity to look at these fundamental issues. Uh, what were you referring to there as the post office review? Well, the, the government had promised to publish a white paper on the post office, which, because of all this, was delayed and was publishing, published um, subsequently. Thank you. And also, I'm sorry, the other thing is that um, it, when we uh, formed the government in 1997, uh, we had very strict spending totals, uh, but we undertook to do a comprehensive spending review in, I think, 1999. So anything we decided with the post office, if we, you know, whatever we decided, we almost certainly need public expenditure um, support. So that would have been in the spending review. So I, I think, you know, what I am referring to there is the uh, the white paper. Although I think that proved to be, you know, it didn't come along for a while. And you uh, continue. I am clear that um, it should also include an examination of the current relationships between uh, Pockle and other parts of the public sector. And then in four, you make this point: we have to consider other aspects of the government service to the public. For example, should the DSS be bound to use the post office when with new technology it could use more automatic management and payment systems, which are arguably to the benefit and convenience of it uh, to its customers. There could also be substantial reductions in costs. At the moment, the DSS has a huge IT project, which is over budget and behind schedule, which is designed to use Pockle rather than other means of payment. BA contract is worth about a third of Pockle income, about £630 million pounds per annum. We're also aware that D, the DT, DETR is concerned about the level of payments made by the um, DVLA um, to Pockle. Um, the CSR process should allow us to discuss these costs as well as the implications for the post office. If we are, in fact, subsidising Pockle, should we not say so? Uh, are you refer... Yeah. Are you referring there to what was an indirect or hidden subsidy of Pockle being broken out into a more transparent um, way for uh, the public? Yes. And if, as I said to you earlier, if the government wants to maintain a post office network, uh, and you know, there's nothing wrong in policy terms of saying, and to do that, um, we will subsidise it. Because I said a number of these branches were at that time uh, you know, financially uh, incapable of standing on alone and it's a perfectly legitimate position to take what i'm saying here is and i referred to this in my previous answer um, i think that the, the csr is a comprehensive spending review process would allow us to look at all those costs um but you know what what you know what i'm driving at and you know, it's a theme of you know my my statement is that if you're going to if you your starting point is we need to subsidize the post office network that's fine but what you shouldn't be doing is spending a lot of money on devising an elaborate way of doing it, uh, which was inappropriate uh, for all the reasons that I've stated. And as we, as correspondents are proceeding all the time, it was becoming increasingly obvious that it was never going to be delivered on time, if ever. Thank you. Uh, that letter can come down. Thank you. Thank you. So far as we've been able to establish, um, nothing further happened so far as your uh, role as um, Chief Secretary to the Treasury um, uh, occurred in uh, later in 1997 and early 1998 um, in, your, in relation to the Horizon Project. I don't suppose you've got any independent recollection of whether that's correct or not. You'd be reliant on the papers too. I, I would be reliant on the papers. It's, during that time, I was involved in the preparation of the government's comprehensive spending review, which is a major undertaking. So as part of that, the post office would have figured. Uh, but I'm afraid without seeing 
contemporary papers, it's 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 very difficult for me to say. You know, this is getting on for twenty five years ago, and yes, my memory is okay, but it's not that it's not that accurate. Can we uh, move forwards then to the period March July nineteen ninety eight, still in your role as Chief Secretary to the uh, Treasury? and a letter that you wrote to Margaret Beckett, who was still, I think, um, Secretary of State for Trade and Industry, um, CBO um, 6017. And if we um, go to the second page, please, <coughs> and scroll down, uh, we'll see that... Um, it was PP'd on your behalf, approved by you in your absence. Yes, that was my principal private secretary at that time. Mr Schofield, yes. And then if yes. we go back to the first page, we'll see it's a letter dated, if we scroll down a little bit, thank you, the 3rd of March 1998, to um, Margaret um, Beckett. Um, you say, dear president, um, you have seen um, Harriet Harman's letter of the 27th of February and you say, I'm increasingly concerned about this project, and I agree we need an urgent um, review. We don't have a copy, uh, as I understand it, of Harriet Harman's letter of the 27th of February 1998. Can you recall what led to your increasing concern? Well, no, I haven't seen uh, you know, a copy of Harriet Harman's letter. No, it's, um, it's not been disclosed to us either. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, it was just a, a gradual um, realisation uh, from, you know, everyone concerned that, that this this was a project running into difficulty. You know, one of the things that, you know, I, you ought to be aware of is that ministers do speak to each other. Not, we don't just um, deal with each other through correspondence. And, you know, my recollection is that, you know, throughout this period, I raised it from time to time with uh, colleagues. And certainly as we get later on to this process, um, you know, when we were, there was quite a, a division between what we should be doing about the benefit payment card, uh, it was a lot of conversations. But I, I think my evidence to you is this, that it was becoming obvious, you know, right from the time that, you know, probably starting with John Denham's letter, that this project was in trouble. And therefore, we needed to look and see what we could do about it. The Treasury obviously doesn't wasn't taking a policy view on whether we should be with the benefit payment card or whatever. But the Treasury rightly... Um, it took the view that if something's in trouble, there's almost certainly going to be a financial consequence. Can we scroll down the page, please? You say a meeting will be useful, but before we can reach any conclusions, I think we need to ask our officials to prepare an agreed analysis of the options, including an assessment of whether the project <coughs> is technically viable, and if so, how it can be completed and at what cost um, to... Um, government. Uh, that phrase, um, technically viable, is one that you obviously use in this letter here, and is one that we will see is picked up in the um, subsequent Montague report yes. later in the year. But what did you mean by your use of the phrase, technically viable? Well, in blunt terms, whether it would work or not. Is that right, or, or do you mean that it's feasible in principle? Well, it's both, isn't it? You know, if it's not feasible in principle, it's difficult to see how it could ever work. Uh, but you know, what I, that, that, that my interpretation of the technically viable used here, and in Adrian Montague's report, and you're right that he does he does use that that term as to whether or not it was going to you know be delivered in a way that would be satisfactory to you know the end the end user, which that it was the DSS and indeed you know. Uh, other parts of it to um, post office counters. Can we go over the page, please? Um, you're asking there for an assessment of, and this is the second bullet point, the direct and indirect costs of cancellation and of any alternative available yeah. to deliver the project's objectives. So essentially a financial assessment. Yes, I mean, look, the, the Treasury, as you would expect, before any decision was to be made, would have a rigorous examination, which would start off, is the status quo going to work? If it's not going to work, then you look at the alternatives. And, you know, not surprisingly, the Treasury um, would be concerned about any aspects of uh, expenditure, no matter how they arose, whether it was cancellation or anything else for that matter. So that's why I raised that point. 
Um, you know, I think you see in paragraph three, it says the Treasury is in a good position to see both sides of the case. Um, yeah, I mean, as you would expect from you know the you know one of the most important departments in the government, that it would it would take a rigorous view of everybody's point of view. Uh, but obviously, the Treasury has a particular interest in public expenditure. You say in that paragraph three that um, you suggest the setting up of a small working group uh, and list the representation to report within two to three weeks and the sentence that you've just highlighted. Is that a reflection of the fact that there were very divided positions, in particular between the DSS and BA on the one hand and the DTI and the post office on the other? Uh, to an extent, um, they were warring uh, with the Treasury sat in the middle. Well, I'm not sure I would use that term, but you, you, you know, you're right that the, the, the DSS and the Benefits Agency, by extension, had a, a clear view, and it was becoming clearer by the day, that this was the wrong solution. And, um, you know, to be blunt, they didn't want it. Obviously, if you look at it from the DTI as the sponsor department of the post office, uh, you know, it, it could see all too clearly that if you did not have a mechanism that built-in footfall, if you like, there would be a big problem with the post office and that you then have to look at, you know, direct subsidy or other matters, which is to say that that's a problem that subsisted, you know, you know it's still there now. Um, but uh, the, the, the Treasury here was not, you know, I, I would regard it as three, three groups of people and certainly three ministers, all of whom were acting in good faith uh, and uh, looking at it from an overall government point of view as to what's right. It was just an attempt to have a look at this, see whether or not you could make it work. If it couldn't, then we'd have to look at um, the alternatives. You continue, the group would need to appoint consultants to address the first question, that's technical viability. So you were proposing here the setting up of a small working group, reporting within two to three weeks with the assistance of consultants, yes? Yes, that's right. Um, and that was on the 3rd of uh, March. Can you recall what came of that suggestion? Was it the creation of the working party led by Adrian Montague? I think that's right, but I mean, I, you know, I've not seen any papers that would um, guide me to that conclusion. Uh, but uh, you know, I think that that's, I think, if I remember rightly, that the Adrian Montague thing was probably the main driver of that would probably be the Treasury because the Treasury used Adrian Montague to do a number of reports. In my experience, we, you know, he was quite good at it. Um, so I suspect, um, I, I think, I think that is right. Uh, but you know, the PA, I recollect, did look at some aspect whether we're doing it under the aegis of this short examination or not. I can't be sure because I just have not seen the papers that would allow me to reach a firm conclusion on that. Thank you. That can come down. Uh, you were appointed as Secretary of State for Social Security on the 27th of July 1998. Uh, did you require to be briefed as to the department's position in relation to the Horizon Project uh, when you took over your new role? Or was that unnecessary because um, you had picked it up as Chief Secretary to the Treasury? Well, look, I picked it up, but in my experience, whenever you arrive in a new department, uh, you know, including the Treasury, um, you know, for the first two or three days, they will tell you about, you know, if you like, going concerns. I mean, as in going concerns, they're things they're concerned about. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I can't, I'd, there's certainly no papers here, as, as, you know, I fear we've found out. They would tell you what exactly I saw. But I, I do remember in the first evening I was there having a long conversation with then Permanent Secretary, uh, who frankly reeled off a, a tale of woe about everything just about. But I can't remember whether or not this was part of it. But I would have seen papers. And again, this is what I was early talking about right at the start. The stuff that I know I would have seen, you know, briefings on things. And I'm pretty sure because this was such a big concern, uh, you know, to the department that I would have been, they would have told me, you know, quite rightly, these are things they're concerned about. But I wasn't coming fresh to it for reasons we've discussed. You know, I was, I knew about it. Um, but, um, and actually, I, as I said to you, I could, I could see the department point of view long before I got to the department. Can we look at your witness statement, please, um, at page eight? It will come up on the screen for you. All right, fine. At 
paragraph 21 at the top, you say, in my role as Secretary of State, uh, I was committed to delivering the government's policy on welfare reform. And following my arrival in the department, it became clear to me that fundamental reform was required across the board, and in particular in relation to the way in which benefits were being paid to approximately 15 million people every week. In particular, I came to the view that the BPC, the benefit payment card, was not the right way to achieve the effective and long-term reform of benefit payment systems, principally for three reasons, and then you set them out. Uh, when you say I came to the view, um, was that then, upon arrival in the um, uh, uh, department, or was it something that developed iteratively over the following 10 or so months until May 1999? No, as I said to you, I, the, the view was forming in my mind all the time I was Chief Secretary on this matter uh, came before me. Um, and, you know, at, at a very early stage, you know, I can't tell you whether it was days or, or weeks, but I think, it, you know, it was very soon. I came to... The, well, sorry, there's two stages here. One is... I was very clear before I got to the uh, Department of Social Security, and I think it's in the public domain, it was well known I was going there uh, because, you know, things had gone, you know, rather wrong. Uh, and I, so I was very clear some major changes were going to be needed, in particular in the way which we paid benefits and, you know, the way that we, the, the benefits agency was there to pay money to people who were out of work, but it wasn't there to get them back into work. Uh, so, you know, I, I, there was big changes that were needed there, which ultimately led to the DWP being formed, you know, 18 months or so later. But in, in relation to the benefit payment card, I came to the view very quickly that, frankly, it, was, it just wasn't the right way to achieve, achieve the long-term reform of benefit systems, including, you know, I mentioned it in the following paragraphs, I thought it was just wrong in principle. You know, if we wanted to get people included in the system, then you know one of the, one of the ways you did that was to make sure that if they could, you'd pay their money into their bank account, just in the way that if they were in work, they'd get their wages and salaries paid into a bank account. You set out the three reasons, um, uh, and in the the first of them at paragraph twenty two, if you just read that to yourself, twenty two. Yes, I can see it. It stigmatised benefit recipients created two classes in society. By contrast, ACT was a way to tackle social exclusion. Yes. Uh, I also considered that it was wrong in principle to require people to go to the post office to receive their benefits when there was a more convenient method of benefit payment available. Th th that overall, would you agree, is a reason of principle not related to the, the planning, delivery, timing, or quality of the Horizon system? Yeah, absolutely. But I thought you, know, you, you asked me through the questions I got initially, why did I take, reach the decisions that I did? And I thought it was right to tell you that one of them was in principle. There's actually, you know, I don't know it's before the inquiry, but in amongst the DSS papers I sent, is there a very good academic work by Professor Elaine Kempson, who goes into some detail about the stigmatised um, uh, you know, benefit recipients, and, you know, mentions that ACT is one of the ways in which you can help do. It's not the only way by any means. Uh, but, no, this is, a, I, you know, I, you know, I, it's a theme of my statement. I just thought it was wrong in principle. And because the thing had run into the contract, had run into difficulties, it was right to start looking at this from, from the start, if you like, and what would you do if you were doing that? I think can we scroll down to the second reason that you give? in paragraph um, 23, uh, the card was not the most cost-effective or best solution, particularly as it was not intended for long-term uh, use. Yes, I mean, I mean is it the long-term use thing, I think it's probably after I got to the DSS that was, you know, I was told by officials, you know, that, because it wasn't immediately obvious in the Treasury that was the case, but that sort of it was added to my doubts about this project. It was a temporary fix, if you like. Um, and you say in the last two lines, by moving straight to ACT, it would estimate that the DSS would save £400 million a year, and the banks have been delivering ACT for years. You've mentioned that already. So it yep. had a proven track record. In those circumstances, I didn't consider the BBC, BPC to be a good investment of public funds. I believe there were better ways to manage the loss of income to pockle that would result from the adoption of ACT 
as the means uh, of payment of benefits. And so that second reason, that's essentially a, um, a reason of principle um, uh, run along with a, the financial case for ACT and against the benefit payment card, not related to the planning, delivery, quality or timing of the Horizon system. W would you agree? Yes, that's a fair summary of my position. And then the third reason that you give, um, by July, in paragraph 24, by July 98, the project was thoroughly stalled. In November 97, ICL had been placed in breach of contract by public sector parties for failure to meet a key operational milestone, and the DSSBA had issued a notice of cure, which was due to expire on the 12th of August 1998, and was unlikely to be met. Is that um, reflective of the view that you expressed earlier, that the project was doomed to failure? Yes. And indeed, I think at the end of last week, uh, you sent, the inquiry sent me another document which it had just uncovered, I assume, you know, which, which added to that, you know, it was, it was a, um, an assessment by outside reviewers of the contract, which just, you know, and obviously I had not seen that till the end of last week, but I mean, there was a growing recognition, as I said before, that this was a project that had stalled uh, and that, you know, the, the, the timescale for it being fixed, if ever that was going to be possible, was slipping off into the distance. So that third reason is related to the performance of the project and accordingly the performance of ICL pathway within it? Yes. Now, one of the first things to, that can come down, thank you. One of the first things to confront you on entering your new position as Secretary of State would have been the report of the independent panel of experts led by um, Adrian Montague. The report we know was delivered the week before your arrival um, in your new position on the 27th of July, 1998. I wonder whether we could look at it, please. Poll 302-8094. You can see, if we scroll down, it's dated July, 1998. Yes, I see it. Thank you. And then if we go over the page, and uh, the page again to page three, now, you would have um, presumably received this with a, um, a, a backing paper or a cover note or a formal submission to Minister. Yes, I, mean, I, I do remember it, because I say I, I, I knew Adrian Montague, so, you know, it was an added thing, if you like, uh, that, um, you know, I thought it was important. But there would all, yeah, I'm very certain there would have been a covering note or submission to go with it. And what, what was, what's your practice, what was your practice then? Would you read the attachment or would you read the submission um, where officials told you what you should make of the attachment? No, I would read both. Um, you know, if somebody sent me a report, I mean, you know, you know, I'm saying this in, 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 after having been in government 13 years, if somebody gives you a report, you should read the whole thing. Uh, you know, I've seen ministers in the past make the mistake of not doing so. You need to read the whole thing. I'm pretty sure all of, would, all of the um, Montague report would have been uh, given to me, uh, and not just bits of it. Um, although, the, you know, as, uh, if we're going through it, there are bits of it that jump out, uh, and certainly jumped out to me. The um, chair of the inquiry is very familiar with the report. A number of witnesses have been taken to it previously. So I'm going to only take you to limited parts, if I may. But um, if there are parts that you have in mind that jumped out to you, and I don't mention them, then please um, do say so. Can we look at the findings first, please? <clears throat> yes, do that. Um, uh, on um, th that page, under the first bullet point of findings on page three, yeah. um, the authors say the programme is complex, probably the biggest of its kind. Its scale, particularly the development work required, were underestimated initially. Parties have since increased the resources devoted to the programme, but a range of issues remain to be resolved. Uh, yeah. Secondly, our view is the programme is technically viable. Uh, there must be some risk around scalability and robustness because the system uh, has had to be tested at the level of component parts, but we are satisfied these risks are being well managed uh, by pathways, uh, by pathway. Um, 
did you understand technically viable in the sense that we discussed before, namely feasible, as opposed to the existing elements of the system, whether alone or in combination, are presently technically robust? I regarded that as being feasible, but if you look at the, all of the, the findings, they're heavily <coughs> qualified. Um, you know, that, um, uh, and, and again, if you look at the plot of a way forward, you know, they, they looked at, you know, they mentioned, I think it's a second option, it was stopping the benefit um, payment card altogether. And again, if you look at the, um, the part two, uh, in, I think it's an appendix, uh, you know, they, they outline a series of problems. So I think what I took from this was it was technically possible um, to produce a card, but there was an awful lot of difficulties here. And one of them, you know, which they, I think they highlight, is that um, you know, this is, was a massive project and it wasn't helped by the fact that you had, if you like, on the government side, two you know, sponsor departments which had completely different objectives. Can we go to um, page 22, please? So page 23. The panel's view of a possible way forwards. Yeah. Sorry, I've got notes in front of me of the original, but I'll look at it on the screen. That would be better. So what do you want me to look at here? Um, this is page 22, Annex A. The panel's oh. view of a possible way forwards. Um, yes, I've, I can see that here, yes. Th thank you, Lord Darling. We um, sought to find a way forward on which all the parties might agree in principle, subject to negotiations about the detail. We considered all of the options, and then six of them are set out. If yes. you just take a moment to uh, read them. Yes, I'm familiar with them. I've, thank I've you. Them. And then the authors say, taking the options in reverse order, um, each of the last four has fatal flaws if an agreed way is sought. One or more of the parties would be unable to um, accept it. Uh, if we just run through them then, the first bullet point, termination of the complete programme. So that's option six. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this was said to her, would, it would leave Pockle's automation plan set back for at least two years. Um, with um, potential for litigation, with the likely loss of non-government business in the meantime, Pathway would face a significant loss of prospects, reputation and revenue. Um, the second is option five, uh, partial termination, no benefit payment card. So um, partial termination with no restructuring to scrap the uh, BPC, reduce the programme to popular automation, plus um, um, OBCS would unacceptably reduce a pathways revenue stream and leave Pockle with an infrastructure too highly specified for its short-term needs. Um, the third bullet point, I think, is option four. Uh, continuing the program as currently planned would leave pathway below break-even on its investment with infrastructure incomplete for a move into banking and financial services. The introduction of the card the short period remaining of the initial contract term would expose customers to disruption if BA moved to full ACT immediately thereafter. And then lastly, um, at the last bullet point, which I think is option three, um, a simple extension would delay uh, the benefit agency's move to increase use of ACT, prolonging its exposure to high unit cost of benefit payments. Pockle would have little incentive to modernise further. Did you, on reading that, accept that those four options were um, each fatally flawed? and were therefore ruled out. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see the strength and the conclusions they reached in, in paragraph two. Um, and this also raises a point which we haven't touched on so far, which um, you will see generally um, the government did consider, and that is, you know, it, it, it had a contract uh, with, um, on pathways it was, it was then called, and governments have to think long and hard if it's got a contract if it's going to terminate, it has to have a reason for doing so, uh, and uh, one, one that will stand up in public as well as uh, in any proceedings. Um, so that that was in our minds. Uh, and um, but I, you know, on, on the other points they make about partial termination, uh, continuing but um, extending it, uh, and you know the difficulties with uh, 
uh, you know, an extension which you just, if you like, postpone the inevitable in my view. So yeah, I, I you know, I, I agree with, with the conclusions they reached. And then scrolling down um, very quickly to option, uh, to paragraph three, uh, we took the opportunity uh, to set out options one and two as the most likely um, to um, provide an agree way forward. That's restructuring the full program or restructuring um, uh, a part of the program with no benefit payment card, options one and two respectively. Options one and two as the most likely to provide an agree way forward. We invited the parties to respond indicating uh, whether either might be acceptable. Pockle and Pathway supported option one, a restructured full program. BA preferred option <coughs> two, uh, a restructured partial program without a benefit payment card. Uh, and then they um, proceed to, the authors proceed to address uh, their view on each of those uh, two options. Uh, I'm not going to take you through that in the interest of time. As we've seen already, the report discusses technical viability. That can come down from the screen. Thank you. Uh, were you um, ever aware, Lord Darling, that the issue of the technical viability of the project had been um, addressed in a rather long and detailed procurement process? No, because that would have been done before our time in government. Um, so, uh, because this, this is a contract, if I remember rightly, that was um, procured and signed in 1996. Correct. I wouldn't have been aware of discussions that took place because ministers of a different administration can't see the papers that ministers saw in a previous one, except in some exceptional circumstances. So you weren't aware of the nature of the procurement exercise that it. No, had, um, that was done, that was done by a previous government, and you know, and, and, and you know, my observation from what you're now just telling me is that even if something had been thought to be technically viable, i.e., it worked or could work in nineteen in nineteen um, uh, ninety six, it doesn't therefore follow that eighteen months, two years later, that you would reach the same conclusion. We were dealing with what we saw in this case in you know, 1997-98. But the obverse might be true, that if the procurement exercise, um, would you agree, had thrown up um, substantial issues of concern with the uh, pathway project, uh, those are matters that the uh, current decision makers may wish to know about. Well, if that had been the case, certainly I wasn't, you know, I wasn't aware about the, of what happened in the procurement uh, process prior to um, us becoming uh, the government. Uh, but, you know, as I say, I, I, what I and my colleagues had to deal with is the emerging evidence that you can see from this and other papers that this was a project that was stalled. It, you know, the things that we thought were going to be delivered weren't being delivered. It was clear that several months, if not longer, were going to be needed to put the thing back into a state where it works. I mean, it's you know, I know from my subsequent experience in the DSS with another computer system. Um, you know, when you start off, it's all full of wonderful possibilities and how much life is going to be easier. And then actually, when you start going along the process, you discover it's not quite like that. Um, so I, I would, even if I'd seen stuff from 1996, which I haven't, um, that would not. It wouldn't then surprise me if two years later everything hadn't turned out quite as anticipated. But as I say, I've not seen those papers, so I, I really you know, can't comment on them. And so you wouldn't have been aware, thinking back to your time in 1998, that the procurement process had involved at a number of stages the seeking and the provision of specialist advice from outside contractors? I wouldn't have been surprised if that was done. But you know, again, I, you know, again, this comes back to an important point. I have not seen papers or any advice about that. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I have not seen it, uh, and I don't recollect it. And you know, my, my, my approach was driven by the evidence that I saw with my own eyes, if you like, and my own experience in government, rather than by uh, you know, material that may or may not have been available to a previous administration. And indeed, you know, I'm, you know if, if my officials were now telling me it doesn't work, um, they wouldn't necessarily have told me, oh, but we thought it was all right two years ago. But what about the obverse? Say you've been told that in the course of the procurement process, the ICL bid had been assessed as the weakest on technical grounds, uh, but it came in lowest on cost. 
I would, have been, I would certainly have been surprised about that and extremely concerned if that was the case. Uh, but I, I, I'm afraid I was, I'm not aware of that because I haven't seen any papers in relation to that. What, what if any prohibition was there on uh, you um, or your um, ministers um, uh, seeing uh, material of the kind that I've just described or a summary of it? Well, look, there's a general rule that you can't see the advice given by civil servants to ministers in a previous government. Um, in relation to technical material, um, I, you know, I'm afraid I, I would need to take, to take advice on that as to whether what you can and can't see. All I can tell you is that, um, and, and you know, actually, you know, my gut instinct, if you like, is if there was some horror that you should have been aware of, then someone should have told you, because that, it's not so much advice, that is a matter of fact, I would have thought, about price and, you know, the assessment. But, you know, as I say, I had not seen that. But in some ways, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I've been saying throughout my evidence so far, my view of this whole thing stemmed not so much in what might have happened in the past, but what I was looking at and then, you know, in that, that present time, which led me to the conclusion that this was going wrong. And that, that, you know, the sooner it was, you know, the contract was, we were out of it. And they looked at some other solution for the post office, the better. The um, convention that you've described about seeing the papers of a previous administration, um, where um, do you uh, obtain your understanding of that convention from? Numerous conversation with civil servants. You know, over, over many years, you know, you'd say, well, how did that happen? I say, well, we can't tell you the, the advice we gave to ministers. And again, I think it's, if you look at the various constitutional, you know, commentaries that you get, it's a fairly, you know, um, you know, it's, a, you know it's, it's fairly well established. You know, the point you're raising, though, is a technical thing that, you know, I do not, if someone had said to me, you do know, don't you, that this was, you know, ranked as low as, you know, the bottom rung when it came to, you know, technical stuff, then I would have, you know, obviously, I came into this, if you like, you know, it's two years down the road. You know, it certainly fortified me, my, me and my belief that this contract was going wrong. But if you're asking me, am I in a position to, to pass comment on the efficacy and the, um, the quality of ICL, I can't do that because I just have not seen the papers that would entitle me to reach a conclusion. And, I, you know, I, would, I wouldn't want to write, reach a conclusion without having seen some evidence of it. No, and I'm what not. you say though, does not surprise me. I, I'm, not, I'm not asking you um, to do that. I'm just at the moment exploring with you the limits of the convention as you then understood it. D did well, you? Did I, sorry, did, you know, had I known you were interested in this, and I suppose I could have made further inquiries and done some further reading, but that is my understanding of the position. You cannot see advice offered to previous ministers. I mean, certainly when we came into office in 1997, I frequently used to ask this as Chief Secretary, say, how the hell did we get into this position? And I can't tell you. Did you understand it to, in the interests of um, continuity of policy, to sometimes uh, have a need to access um, minutes or documents not written by um, uh, your predecessor um, politicians or containing a view expressed su by such predecessor politicians, but to see, for example, technical reports and the like? Well, I don't know because you know that the question was never you know the, what ICLs the the bid that ICL put in was was not raised with me, uh, and I don't you know again this is without knowing exactly what I did see either as Chief Secretary or Secretary of State for Social Security, um, you know it's it's difficult to form a f firm conclusion at, on it. What I'm saying to you from the stuff I have seen that you have provided me with. The view I reached on the efficacy, if you like, of this project was reached on the evidence I saw, rather than you know something that might have happened before that. Uh, and, and you know, and, and you know, to the best of my knowledge, until you raised the matter five minutes ago, the, the ranking of ICL's bid is not something that I was aware of. Thank you. Uh, can we turn to paragraph 27 of your witness statement, um, which is on page 10? You're going to put that on the screen, are you? Yes, it will come up, Lord Tully. <clears throat> Paragraph 
paragraph 27, please. You say, my view on reading the report, <coughs> that's the Montague report, was yeah. a huge project um, where there was fundamental disagreement between the two sponsor departments was doomed. Um, for the reasons stated, I concluded that DSS should withdraw from the project and proceed to ACT, and the government should find a different way um, to make up the loss in income to Pockle. Uh, to be clear, that was a view that you took in July 1998, if not before then, is that right? Well, it, this is a statement of the view that I took, having read the, um, uh, the Montague report, but as I said to you earlier, it's, you know, it, it's, um, it was a view that was formed, pretty much formed around my mind, but this was probably, you know, having read all this, uh, I set out here what the conclusion that I came to. This project was doomed as far as I can see. Did you communicate um, that view, that the project was doomed within government there and then? Because as we'll see, the department, your department, continued to participate in um, tripartite negotiations for many months to come, up until um, April, May of the following year. That is, I am expressing there my view. And, you know, to any of my colleagues I spoke to, I would have said the same thing. You must understand, though, you know, this, this was a situation, the government found itself in a situation where it had a contract, a legally binding contract, though, you know, we, we thought um, ICL was in breach. And we also, you know, you, I'm, I was a Secretary of State for Social Security, but I was also, the, you know, a member of the government that had as one of its policy objectives, as I set out in my statement, was maintaining a post office network. So I don't think there's anything inconsistent with that, having that view, uh, but saying, look, We've got to work something out. I also had to, you know, from, from looking at, if I was, you know, from my, my colleagues' perspectives, they would have a slightly different perspective, particularly from the DTI. We had to go through a number of steps to get collective agreement, uh, which we eventually reached in, um, uh, I think it was May of uh, uh, 1999. So the two, they're not, you know, me standing up and saying it's doomed would not have brought an end to the thing. You know, there were a lot of parties involved, not least this, you know, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, the then Chancellor had a view on it. Thank you. So we've been going um, about an hour and 15 minutes now. Because of the slightly unusual start time for the commencement of Lord Darling's evidence, I, um, means that it would fall to take a break now, um, given the shorthand writers um, prefer, I think, to go for an hour and 10, hour and 15 at, um, at most. Yeah, well, I certainly think we should take a break. The only issue is whether we take a lunch break or a short break. What do you suggest, Mr. Beer? I think probably a lunch break, sir. Right. And so maybe, we'll take, maybe come back. Take our time. hours lunch break now and start again at one thirty. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Fine. Thank. Thank you both. Thank you.